morning. Good morning, everybody. So what is my connection with Write the Docs? Uh, and I want to say that I'm a bit of a has-been. Um, I have been a programmer. I have been someone who works in QA and testing. I have been a project manager and a business analyst. Uh, I have been a tech writer. Uh, I have been a support manager and doing technical support. Um, these days, uh, as Jared mentioned, I'm chief of staff at Fastmail, which means that I get handed all the projects with too many moving parts for anybody else to manage, um, or things that have got lots of legal or policy overviews because I have uh, this breadth of knowledge. And I describe myself as someone who synthesises things. I take things from people all the way around and make sure with my tech writing background that the customer is being represented no matter what we're building. Right, the subtle art of interrogation. What are we going to be looking at today? First I'm going to be saying why is it that we need to interrogate people at all? Why, why is this talk existing? Um, I'm going to explain why actually we are often not very good at doing this. Um, the kinds of things that can interview, that, that impact on your ability to have a great interview and get the information that you need, and then how do we go about getting better. All right, so why are we here? We're here because of zombies. <laughs> <laughs> Let me set the scene for you. A timer is counting down in a darkened room. The world's leaders are pacing around, looking very anxious as they stare up at the computer screen, watching the zombie virus spread across the world. They are looking at the end of humanity as we know it. They're talking about apocalypse and doomsday scenarios. And now cut to the tense scene of a hero who has blazed her way through, we'll call her Alice. She has blazed her way through and she's sitting in front of a computer, a computer that has uh, software in it that will deploy a zombie cure and turn everybody back into humans. Her guns can't help her now. She needs to know how to use the software. So she phones back to base. And you have to answer the phone and you have to teach her how she can use this software to save the world. You're the only person who can help her save the world. In fact, the, wor the future of the world rests on your shoulders. The problem here is that we are not actually the best at this software. So the red bars on my graph are for documentarians. The blue ones are for the evil scientists who invented zombies by accident, hopefully. Uh, and then, you know, you've got the programmers, the people who developed the software. So you can see that, well, clearly documentarians are the best at technical writing. Um, we'll, we'll give the evil scientists a little bit of tech writing credit because they've probably had to write some grant proposals along the way. Um, we've got uh, evil scientists who are really good and know lots about zombies. We have, as technical writers, needed to learn a little bit about zombies, so we're second best at understanding zombies. Programmers know nothing about zombies other than, uh, you know, shoot them in the head. When it comes to world-saving software, clearly the programmers know the most about world-saving software. The evil scientists have no idea. Uh, hmm, once again, documentarians are second best. So while we are not experts, other than writing documentation, we are second best at all of the other things. So how do we get this knowledge? How do we end up becoming second best at all of these things? We do that by interviewing other people and picking up their knowledge. Some might say we drink their brains dry. <laughs> so next time you need to interview someone, just imagine yourself as this killer bunny drinking someone's brain dry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not very sorry. <laughs> OK, so here we are, back to our scene. It's the end of the world, darkened room, anxious pacing leaders, the apocalypse is coming, the zombies are coming to take over the world. Alice is ringing you up, help me, how do I operate this software, uh, but you can save the world because you are sitting there and you can talk to the uh, software developer and you can say, right, how do, we, how do we work this software? The software developer is not going to talk to Alice because the software developer will be like, well, you've got to compile the thing and twiddle the frog nits and oh, I forgot about those 16 steps because of course you take it for granted because you've written the software and you know everything. It's only us who can save the world because we know to fill in those extra 16 steps. 
So how do we go about getting better at interviewing techniques in order that we can save the world? Let's talk about interviewing. I mean, it's just talking to people, right? We've probably been doing that since the age of about 18 months. How hard could it be? <laughs> fine. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have a bit of a David Attenborough moment now. Let's consider the writer in their nature, natural habitat. <laughs> They're happiest when producing and consuming words. They have a fondness for fresh stationery. <laughs> They're often a solitary creature. Some might consider them an introvert. Anyone recognise themselves? <laughs> All right, so let's do this. We need to save the world. We need to interview those experts. And nothing says great at talking to people like the introvert who prefers being solitary. And as we all know, you know, to add complications into the mix, other people always have time to answer lots of pestering questions, particularly when they're things like, but why? All right, so let's do this. Let's talk about ways in which we, the proud introverts, can actually improve our interviewing skills and save the world. First, know thyself. It is important to recognise that we don't actually have to be perfect, and in fact, Perfect will mean that we never even get started at doing things. It's okay to build up, up your knowledge and sit there and recognise that you might take initially two or three goes in interviewing someone before you get all the knowledge that you need. Don't expect that you will do a perfect job up front. That gives you permission to not, you know, be perfect, to just get out there and give it a go and get what information you need and then come back later. The other thing is that you uh, need to remember that you, can, you too can be a time lord. Um, interviewing people well takes time and space. Uh, it, it's often not something that we might naturally be a fit for. Uh, it can be for an introvert. Talking to people and interviewing people can be exhausting. So you need to give yourself time beforehand to prepare and time afterwards to recover. Fortunately, the interviewing process naturally gives you time afterwards to recover. You often need to go and write up your notes and turn it into something intelligent. Um, so there is a natural ebb and flow for it, but you might want to um, consider what time of the day works best for you in order to give yourself that time and space. All right, let's talk about them. Our subject matter experts, our SMEs, those people that we need to interview to get the knowledge that we are after. I've kind of broken them up into four broad categories of people because there are different approaches that you can take depending on who you're talking to and where they're at. And I've split it into two axes on whether people have the time to talk to you and whether they're willing to talk to you. Uh, some people might not have the knowledge or maybe they just don't have the desire to be put under the scrutiny. Other people have got plenty of time, other people just so busy and docs aren't a priority for them. So let's talk about what they, what they look like and uh, how we can get the information out of them. I'm going to do this through desserts. We'll move away from zombies for a minute. Uh, on to desserts. So, you know, the nirvana of dessert is someone who is both willing and able. They've got the time, they've got the knowledge and they're happy to sit down and talk to you. This is the best. Um, this turns out to be not an interrogation. This is true two-way communication. They understand why you're asking. Uh, they understand what you're trying to produce. They will help you edit the content afterwards. Um, they will help you vet it for technical correctness. Uh, they're a good test audience to review what you've written. You want to make friends with these people. You want to eat chocolate cake every day. Um, you can even use them down the line if you've produced content from someone else. You can hit these kind of people up and say, hi, can you just uh, give this a quick once over for me? Um, you know, your feedback was really useful last time. 
gives them lots of thank yous. Um, so you want to you want to keep them around. You can also use these chocolate people chocolate cake people to advocate for you in the future because clearly they understand um, the value of what you're doing and why you're doing it. These people are a delight to work with. Depending on your organisation, you may not have them in the wild or maybe you are blessed with a plethora of them. <coughs> All right, so moving along, we've got people who've got plenty of knowledge. They understand what you're doing, but maybe they don't have any time. So these people are the apple in an apple pie. You can't make an apple pie without apple, but the apple on its own is not sufficient. So you actually need to do a bunch of work for the information that you get out of them in order to turn it into a delicious and tasty pastry dessert. Um, so these people uh, tend to dump a whole bunch of information on top of you in a short space of time. They might uh, write a big chunk up in an email. They might sit there and what normally you might take an hour to discuss. They might be like, here is 15 minutes and they'll talk at you very fast. Maybe they'll do some diagrams on a whiteboard and then they'll be like, I have to go. Talk to me later. So you've got a big information dump. It's your job then to take that information and turn it into something that is going to be editable and viewable later on. Digestible, I suppose. Um, they will come back and help you review things later on but you probably need to ask for quite structured feedback so that um, they're not feeling like you're asking for um, an immense amount of time. You can sit there and say, look, you know, can you review this, this one section? And then they'll feel like, oh, that's only going to take me two minutes. I'm happy to give you that feedback. If you sit there and hand the whole thing over to them and ask for feedback, they'll be like, oh, this really needs a lot more space for my brain right now than I have time for. I will come back to this later on. And then that usually means never. So these apple pie people are still great. They will advocate within your organisation for you, particularly to other people, because they'll be like, well, I'm too busy, but maybe these other people will help. Um, still good people to keep around. Uh, fairy floss, it's delicious, right? But I probably wouldn't want to eat it every day. Uh, it's not got much substance to it. It can be very sticky. You get about three quarters of the way through and you're like, have I even eaten anything? But now, no, no, no. <laughs> and sometimes at the end you can feel a little bit sick. I like this picture. Like this is bigger than this, this lady's head who's holding it. It's fantastic. My kids would be all over this. All right, so these people are a bit of a time waster. They've got, lot, got lot, heaps of time. They love hearing themselves talk. They love having a cat captive audience, someone who wants to ask them questions about what they've done, um, but they don't have the content. Now, sometimes this can be because they don't understand it. They're like, happy to talk to you, but maybe you, you're just talking to the wrong person. Sometimes they don't have the content because they are feeling maybe that they don't understand their own work or they don't understand why you're asking, so they're answering a question over here and you're trying to really get the information over here. Um, you can either try and guide them so that you're uh, narrowing the focus so that you can more clearly see and they can see whether they actually have the knowledge you're looking for. And sometimes you just got to cut and run. Like, there is really only so much fairy floss I can eat today. Thanks, it's been half an hour, I have to go. And you can, you'll have to go and find someone else that you can hit up for that information. So the strategy here depends a little bit on why you think they're not producing the content that you're after. And our fourth box is the people who don't have time and they're not willing, they don't have the knowledge. Um, I, I call these people mud people <laughs> because you're not really sure whether all you're ever going to get out of them is a mud pie or maybe, just maybe, if you plant a few seeds, you may be able to grow the apple tree that you can use to produce the apple pie or the cocoa bean to produce the chocolate cake. It's, it's a bit hard to tell, so you need to do some investigation here. Um, could be that they're just too busy and they're not prioritising you and so every time you go and sit there and say, I need to talk to you, they give you the brush off. In which case, you know, maybe you can talk to their manager and say, hi, you know, this person is giving me the brush off, uh, you know, I need this information, here's what, what needs to happen. It could be because they have got too many other things on and they don't think what you're doing is important or they don't think it's relevant to, to them. 
I'm a programmer, I'm under the pump, I've got so much stuff to do. Um, those docs people, they can sort themselves out. It's obvious. So you need to then come back and tie in and say, look, if, I, if you sit down with me for half an hour and you give me the information that I'm after, then that means that I will then go and share that information to the testing team and it means that you will have less support tickets coming back and it gives you more assurance that you know, your pull request will pass through testing and QA and usability testing. Um, it'll blow back less on you when it gets into the, into, into the wild. Uh, you might need to stick someone in front of a uh, user testing panel in order to make that one stick. <coughs> All right, so there's our four types of deserty people. Some are more deserty than others. Um, the goal is always to push your uh, subjects more into that top right corner of the box. Um, and often a key factor to approach it is making it relevant to them, making them see why they should spend the time and bear their soul to you so that you can turn their work into a beautiful piece of art. All right, so let's talk about the interview itself. How do you go about interviewing someone so that they will be more inclined to spend the time with you and give you the kind of quality answers that you're after? So your experts, particularly if you work in IT, are likely to also be introverts. They won't want to talk to you either. Um, they are nervous about talking to people. They find it as hard to deal with as you do. So you need to give them the same time and space that you would give yourself. Um, you and they will do better with an agenda. It's very hard to go into a, into a session and say, so let's talk about stuff. You want to sit there and say, here are my expectations. I need to document this section. It is going to be for this audience. Here is the bits that I have looked at and don't understand. Um, here's where I need your help or I have written this stuff. I need you to review these you know, following points. Uh, and you need to make it relevant to them so that they understand why they're there and why they should spend the time. The other thing, if you have an agenda and set expectations, then it lets them know how much time they need to set aside out of their day. And maybe you want to even ask them, when is a good time for you to do this? It, again, it's part of that introvert managing, managing our, our energy. They might be better first thing in the morning. Yeah, let's knock it over while I'm fresh. Or maybe they want to do it at the end of the day. Because sitting back and talking to people about stuff I already know is easy for me at the end of the day. So your, in, your interview subjects might prefer an end of the day discussion or maybe they want a, an earlier in the morning discussion but by being flexible for them it maximises their ability that they will actually turn up and not blow you off. All right, so you've actually got to conduct the interview somewhere and there are pros and cons to where you actually go about doing this. Um, neutral territory is great. Uh, it means that you are, if you do it at their desk, they are more likely to go, yeah, yeah, I'm talking to you, but I'll just, uh, yep, yep, the answer's, yep, I'm just going to send this one email. So if you can get out and go somewhere else, that gives them the space to get up to what they're doing. You might want to record the interview. Our brains are only so big and the things that you remembered, you know, 15 minutes ago, you are not going to remember in another two hours. You can even use uh, transcription apps so that you can hopefully even get it into text before, you know, in the moment you finish hitting record. Um, if they still don't want to talk to you, you can go the passive approach. Uh, a lot of people these days just work with laptops, so go and sit in the same office as them. Just say, I'm going to work in here for today. I'm not here to interview, I'm just going to work in here today. Uh, and you can hear the kind of conversations that are taking place, and then that gives you the opportunity to just casually, hi, I heard you were talking about X. Uh, I have a question about X. It looks quite like Y today. Why are you making talking about it in X? It's really a Y. The other thing you can do when you are sitting in the same room and it's a little bit sneaky, talk to one of their co-workers in the same room. Hi, I've got this documentation uh, and I'm, I'm going to do this with it. So and this is where you get really sneaky, I think it looks like this. And you start explaining it to someone else in the same room where your subject matter expert can hear you. Nobody can resist. Oh, excuse me, that's wrong. I'm just going to correct you. 
You don't want to do it too often. It's a little bit devious, but you know, hopefully you can draw them in and then they'll be more inclined to talk to you up front next time. All right, so here you are. You're in the middle of the interview. Let's talk about some things that you can do to make your interview more effective. <coughs> Reflective listening. Um, when you're talking to someone and they're talking away at a million miles an hour and you're like, yeah, yeah, I think I get that, I think that I get that, it's really easy to go, yes, yes, I've totally got it all. And then you look back at your notes later on and go, I have no idea what they just said. So you want reflective listening where you echo back to them your interpretation of what they've just said and then you can get a verification that you have understood correctly and that cuts back on the number of cycles that you have to go through and edit process as you try to understand what it is that they've just told you. You want to use lots of flattery. People like helping out other people if they feel that you know they're being validated and worthwhile <laughs> and it costs nothing and almost no time to say thanks for that, that was really super duper useful. Um, I will make sure that the rest of the team knows how helpful you have been today. Some people find it difficult to talk. Being put on the spot and said tell me about your work, and they're like I have to just and they want to run away. Uh, so we have distraction techniques. Get them to use their hands. Uh, now this could be something as simple as like, I've got a whole bunch of information. Uh, let me teach you about information architecture. Here's some sticky notes or some cards. Let's write down some ideas and then we can flesh them out later on. Or, hey, you know, I've written down some ideas. Can we help me put them in order? And while you put them in order, you can use that to say, tell me more about this. I think this is not quite fleshed out. And then they can hold up the card and have a look at it. So you've got some tools to work with so that they've got, they don't have to stare you in the face and feel like they're on the spot. And then we've got that great old adage about talking to the duck. Um, ducks don't have a lot of experience about expense management software or email software or content management systems. Ducks are pretty dumb in the scheme of things. Um, so you, you can even use a genuine real life duck or some other substitute toy of your choice, cuddlier the better, uh, and get them to talk to the duck. And the duck can ask questions like, I don't understand that word you just mentioned. What is that acronym? And because ducks are stupid, nobody takes that personally. They're happy to take stupid questions from a duck. And then there's always plan B. <laughs> You've used all your best techniques and you are still not getting the information you need. There is bribery and corruption. People love talking to you if you turn up every single time with a coffee for them in your hands or a chocolate or chips or whatever their weakness is. Uh, you know, hanging out, finding out what their weakness is and exploiting out the heck out of it is the best. Um, people look forward to your visit at that point. And in fact, they may, it's the principle of recipe reciprocity, a marketing term. If you give something someone for free, then they feel obliged and guilty into wanting to help you back. Uh, there is baiting. Um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier about sitting in the same room. The same thing works when you, if they just can't talk to you, write up what you know. It's bound to be wrong. Send it off to them for the review. Say, if I don't hear back from you, I will publish this about your work. <laughs> and they will be like, here's the 600,000 ways that what you've written is wrong. <laughs> because everybody likes being smart. Again, you don't want to use this deliberately too often because it has the downside of making you look a little bit incompetent. Um, but it is a good way to open that conversation and then you can have that whole, if you had have sat with me in the first place, we wouldn't have even had to waste this time doing this thing. There is usually more than one person involved in any one given project. So do be, do be sure to go and talk to the other people in your organisation that know something about this. You know, business analysts, project managers, customer support, marketing, hopefully someone else knows what's going on, otherwise why on earth is your company doing the thing that you're doing? Um, so you can go and talk to more than one people and it, not only does that give you a more rounded view of what it is that you're trying to present and it might help shape the way you present this to your audience, um, 
but it means that you can fill out any gaps when any one single person doesn't know what's going on. All right, when all else fails, you've gone the good way. You've tried the bribery and corruption. Now what? You can break their spirit. I'm thinking Rick, Rick Rowling, I'm thinking playing fluffy little <laughs> unicorns. I'm just like, if you do not give me this information, I will torture you until you die. Uh, that's probably, yeah. Uh, all right, maybe I should take that one off. Um, ideally, you know, if you're continually running into problems, you've got a cultural problem in your company. It is not going to be down to individual people. The fish rots from the head. Unfortunately, this means you've got an even bigger problem. It means that you need to go up and talk to management and management's management and all the rest of it and say, hi guys, I'm not getting the respect I, I deserve. Uh, I can't do my job. The company objectives that we are trying to meet are at risk. Um, we need you know, corporate support from the top to kind of make, make documentation to be seen as valued so that other people in the organisation will give me the time so I can do my job. Um, this is obviously a bit of a challenge, particularly if you are a lone tech writer in a company um, as opposed to someone in a team. But if you are finding that you're continuously stonewalled, this is probably going to be the problem and you need to find a way to address it. That whole thing about how do you address corporate culture is subject to an entirely another talk, so I will just leave that there. Uh, and of course, you know, final goal, if you have exhausted all other opportunities, you are being set up to fail. Uh, you will be a scapegoat. Well, clearly it failed because you're no good. Um, you can always walk away. Obviously it's not the ideal solution, but hopefully out of what we've, uh, you know, everybody in the room is discovering is that tech writers are not a dying breed, that there is lots of avenues that you can explore and there will be other opportunities out for you in a company that does respect what you have to offer. All right, so we can do this. We've spoken about the ways that you can know yourself and your own limitations. Um, we've spoken about the awareness that not all of your interview subjects are equal and there are different ways to tackle uh, the ways in which they may or may not want to talk to you. And we've, I've given you some ideas and skills to build on that will uh, improve your ability to drive an interview and get the information that you need. Or, you know, call it quits. But remember, it is hard. It's harder than we think. But you don't have to be perfect to just give it a go and whatever you do will be better than doing nothing. Be flexible, there's more than one way to go about it. Bribery, corruption, straight up asking, talking to other people, lots of options. Just approach your task with empathy and kindness for yourself and for your others. Um, just because it's our job to do it and it's their job to help us out doesn't mean that there is not more than one way to go about doing it and there are different ways to get an approach. Do remember that only you can save the world from zombies. Yeah.